All right. Good morning, everybody. Thank you very much for joining us for our press briefing on the state's response to the pandemic. We still have a pandemic going here in the state, so we need people to please continue to practice all the good tools that we've given you to slow the spread of the virus. You may have heard that there's new strains of the virus that may be more transmissible, so that's even more reason why we need to continue to make sure we keep that six foot of distance between ourselves and other people when we're out in public, wear a mask when you go to the store, wash your hands often. If you have that cough or that fever, please stay home because we don't want to spread the virus to somebody else, especially if there may be more transmissible versions of the virus around. So please continue to practice all those good tools Follow the three, you know, avoid the three C's, those crowded places, confined spaces, close contact. That's how the virus is going to spread. So please try to avoid those things if you can. And if you can't, again, that's a great opportunity to wear a mask to be able to slow the spread of the virus. Also, Test Nebraska is out there. It's available. We've done almost 650. Uh, we've done a little over 646,000 tests, uh, almost uh, was 1.9 million assessments just through Test Nebraska. So it's out there, it's free, it's easy. You can go to testnebraska.com and sign up, look for a place to get scheduled. We've been turning the tests around 24 to 48 hours. Very slick program. Please take advantage of testnebraska.com. It's out there for all Nebraskans. Uh, all of this is around making sure we continue to preserve our hospital capacity. And we've successfully done that in Nebraska throughout the course of the pandemic. You can see that we have dropped down to 341 hospitalizations. Our current hospital bed capacity is at 33%. Our ICU bed capacity is at 38%. And ventilator capacity is at 77%. Now, with, if you look at that trend, you can see that we've been uh, dropping down below that blue line. So we're kind of blue in between blue and green, which means we're going into the green phase, which will mean that we're likely going to hit that because we do a seven-day average. So if we continue to see this trend for uh, tomorrow, then we'll be in that green phase of DHM, which essentially means that we'll have 100% occupancy of indoor venues, uh, you know, no restrictions on extracurricular activities for young people. But even though we're in that phase, we still need people to continue to wear masks when they're out in public, to wash their hands, to stay home if you got that cough or that fever, you know, those are the things we're going to need to continue to do, even being in the screen and even with our hospitalizations going down. This is still not the place where hospitalizations were in September, right? We'll have to get down to about the 200 neighborhood for us to be where we were in September. So we need people to continue to please use all our tools, even though we're going into a new phase of the DHM. And also, it's important to remember that in this new phase of the DHM, you still have to quarantine if you've had that close contact. Um, you still have to do all those sort of things. And if you are having a large event uh, defined as 500 more people in uh, the state or in Douglas County, 1,000 more people, you still have to submit your plan to the local health department to get approval for that plan. And that's really there to help you make sure you can plan your event and keep uh, people healthy. So we want you to do that. Also part of the new DHM, a couple of other changes. Uh, one, uh, the CDC guidance is that if you've had coronavirus in the last three months, that if you've had that close contact, you can self-monitor, which means you can go out, you don't have to quarantine, but you have to wear a mask everywhere you go for 14 days. And of course, if you develop symptoms, you have to stay home. If you have that cough or fever, stay home. So again, that's, an, that's new in the DHM, that if you've had COVID, wear a mask, self-monitor, monitor for symptoms. If you have symptoms, you have to stay home, but you can go out and you have to do that for 14 days, wear that mask everywhere you go. Also, we're putting in our DHM that if you are fully vaccinated, which means you get both doses of Pfizer and Moderna, and you have a close contact, again, you can self-monitor. And that means wear a mask when you go out for 14 days in public. Have to wear that mask. And again, if you develop symptoms, stay home. So you'll be able to self-monitor. You won't have to quarantine, but you will have to self-monitor, which means wearing that mask every time you go out. This is also similar to the policy we had for school-age kids and extracurricular activities. So this is something we've done before. And again, the idea here is we really want people to get vaccinated. We hope that this is an incentive for people to get vaccinated, especially as we start moving into that 65-year-old and older category. Now, speaking of uh, vaccines, uh, we are in phase 1B in most of the state. 
With the exception of two health districts, Lincoln Lancaster and Douglas County, we expect both those health districts to be in phase 1B next week, which means they're going to start moving into the 75-year-olds and the 65-year-olds. So that's where we expect that to go. Uh, also, a couple things. We've got a couple people here to talk. Um, vaccine program has come along very well. This week through Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, we've actually just, uh, vaccinated 23,000 people. So that's good news. We get about 23,500 every week. So that shows that we're being able to get those vaccines out. I want to compliment the local health directors who've done such a great job in being able to help do that. And so uh, Angie Ling, our incident commander for the Department of Health and Human Services, is here to be able to talk more about the vaccine program and where we see the progress there. We uh, also, again, uh, since we're moving out of phase 1A into phase 1B, can tell you 99% of those long-term care facilities we have verified have at least had their first dose go through, which is really good news to help protect that very vulnerable population. So that's very good news. So Angie Lee is going to be able to talk about that. Other big news we're going to have is talking about the state registration website. We did our soft launch yesterday, and we had 54,000 people sign up for it. I think it all went very smoothly so far. Lori Snyder, who is really the person in charge of launching that website, is going to come up and talk a little bit about that after Angie gets done talking about the vaccine program. Uh, so with that, Angie, I'm going to ask you to come up and tell us a little about the vaccines, and then you can turn over to Lori, and then we'll go to questions and answers. Angie? Good morning. Uh, I just have a real quick update today. Next week's primary dose allocations will be Pfizer 11,700 first doses and Moderna 15,500 uh, first doses, which is an increase of 3,700 doses of Moderna. We've also been told that we will be getting a 16% increase for the next few weeks, but we have not received confirmation on what our actual vaccine product specific allocations will be. What that means is I don't know if we're going to be getting increased in Pfizer and Moderna or if it's just going to be Moderna. This week, we're just shy of that 16% um, increase. <clears throat> As of next week, the entire state will be moved into Phase 1B, with the priority being the residents age 65 and older. The local health departments will be able to work through the worker categories as allocation allows, but will, it will take longer to get through those groups. We're working very closely with our FEMA representatives and NEMA to understand the different resources available to us at this time. Um, at this time, Nebraska is not requesting a FEMA site as it does not bring any additional allocation to our state, um, but, and we're currently able to sustain our vaccination efforts with our current support and allocations coming in. Also, we're working with Operation Warp Speed team and the Federal Pharmacy Program to determine what doses are over allocated to the Federal Pharmacy Program, and we'll be bringing those back to the state. So what that means is we had to allocate a specific amount to the Federal Pharmacy Program, um, and the way they calculated it, we knew we were probably going to allocate a little more than we have really needed to. And so now that they're through their first doses, they're able to tell us what they have left over, and then we'll be getting that back to the state in the coming weeks. Um, yesterday, we launched a vaccine scorecard to show a better picture of how our state is doing. Yeah, great. These changes will eventually transition into the dashboard, um, but we wanted Nebraskans to have this information now. So as you can see on the left side of the screen, we've changed um, our numbers to allocated versus the distributed that's on the dashboard currently. So you can see what's come into our state, and we've broken it out into first and second doses. That allocated number will be updated on a week, uh, weekly basis, so it'll allow for us to get the doses into the state and then update the dashboard on what we can actually use. Um, so for example, on Sunday, we'll update everything we've received this week because we're able to start using it next week. Um, as you can see, this is pretty impressive that we're at 83, oh, it's updated just since I've been here. So 86% of our first doses have been utilized. Um, so we are getting shots in arms, and I think this is a great display of where we're actually at for the, um, our Nebraska vaccine program. The second doses, um, we can only do what we can do with the proper intervals. So we look at that to um, be a little bit lower just because people need to get those at the proper intervals. 
And then you can see on the right side the federal pharmacy program, and they're actually doing pretty well um, with the 60% of that first dose administered. And then as we change, like I said, the federal pharmacy program, as it, we reallocate it back to the state from the federal pharmacy program, you'll see those numbers adjust um, so we can um, have a good account of where we're at. Um, and as many of you know, our state vaccine registration system went live yesterday, and we've received over 54,000 registrations as of this morning. And today, our DHHS Chief Information Officer, Lori Snyder, is here to discuss this in more detail. So, Lori, if you want to come on up. Okay, thanks. I'm looking forward to telling you about, about this because I think this is really going to help us. So today we are, or yesterday, we actually launched a new vaccination system. It has three parts. So the first part is a registration portal, and that's what we're going to talk about today. There is also a vaccine administration system that our providers will be able to use when we're doing mass vaccination clinics and things like that. And we may talk about that at another time, but for right now, I want to focus on the portal. And behind that, there's a dashboard and a data warehouse so that we can help DHHS and the local public health departments so that they can reach out and monitor and make sure that if there are any populations in the state who maybe aren't getting the vaccine, who need additional support, maybe they need technology support, maybe they need language support, um, whatever it is, that we can identify those and help really um, get to those folks so that they have an equal opportunity to get the vaccine. There's a few key points that I want to talk about here. Um, the first is that rolling the system out does not change the vaccination schedule at all. So what Angie talked about, it's not going to slow us down. It's not going to do anything like that. Um, if you already have appointments and you're already moving forward with your local public health departments, continue to do that. You'll be fine and they, you don't need to worry about this. Um, also, this registration is only for Nebraskans. So if you are not a Nebraskan, it won't do you any good to try to sign up because you can't. We really, we get our allocations by state, and so we want to be sure that the allocations are going to Nebraskans. Um, I want to just reiterate this. If you are already registered with a local public health department, then you do not need to register again, and you don't need to call them to check if you're registering. We are working with them, and I'll talk a little bit more about this process later, but we are working with them so that we make sure that as they start using more and more of the system, that we don't lose anybody, that we choreograph that carefully, that the process is very careful, and that we make sure that if you are already registered, your, your data will be in the new system, and we will be able to continue to effectively select you and get you scheduled for appointments and get you vaccinated. Another thing, a lot of times when systems roll out like this, people are really worried. They, you know, I think about the Thanksgiving, people stand in line overnight to to get the, the deal, right? You don't have to stand in line over this. It is not a first in, first out. Um, we need to get you in, so do it at some point. Don't put it off, but you don't have to do it right this minute. If you get in today, tomorrow, over the weekend, early next week, you're fine. So don't rush and feel like stressed. I know sometimes people are at work or they can't get off and then they worry that they didn't get in first. Don't worry about that, you'll be fine. And I'll talk a little bit about how that works in a minute. Um, other things, concerns that people sometimes have is if you don't have a computer or a smartphone or you just don't have the technology um, and you don't um, think that you can register, we have a number of things I'm going to talk about later to help you register. So be assured that we have um, thought of many things for that and, of course, welcome if we've, we've missed something, but we'll talk through that so that you can see that we've really tried to be very, very inclusive. The English site has launched, and what we need to do is make sure that we're you know, fully, all of the, everything is exactly how we want it to be. And then we will do a fast follower with the Spanish site. Again, speaking to the fact that we have a couple other ways to register if people want to get in right away, and the fact that it's not first in, first out, this will not disadvantage anyone. Okay, I just want to be really clear about that. But we do expect the Spanish site to be up about mid-February. So that will be a fast follower. We are looking at any other languages, and on the the um, DHHS website, which I will show you an address for that later, you will be able to see that we have some language support and that there are some training materials and things like that also being um, translated into other languages as well. And I'll go into that as well. So um, any of you who want to like sound really cool to your friends and use a word, you can use a word called digitally aware. And what that means is if you want to sign up from your phone or your tablet or your computer, you can use any of those and the screens will look the right size. So. That'll be your word for the day if you want to be really cool. Um, and then, as always, we want you to practice the three C's. 
So I'm gonna talk you through a little bit about how this works. And this is how the new system will work. So realize that if you're working with your local public health departments, continue to do that right now. And we will be working with them on a transition plan. We wanna orchestrate that very carefully so that we don't lose anybody along the way. But this is how the new system works. Um, you get online to register and we'll show you that registration address at the end. Um, when you register, you're gonna get a little thank you um, note on your screen that tells you you got registered. If you put an email address in, it will also, get, that will come to you. And we know that those will come within 24 hours. Some of those come fast, some of those come a little slower, but you will get it within 24 hours. So you don't need to call if it doesn't come to you. Now, if it doesn't come in 24 hours, which I'm not expecting, but then you can call the hotline, okay? So then you will sit in this pool and, and wait until it's your turn. And, and Angie's gone over the phases before, so you know the phases that you go through to get selected. You know, it's healthcare workers first, and then 75 and up, or 65 and up, um, and then, you know, we work down the tiers. So when your turn comes, you will get an email notification, and it will have a unique link only to you. So you can't post it on Facebook. It, it won't work for anyone else. When you get that email, you can go in and you know it's your turn and you can sign up. And the system will have scheduling options for you. And any of the places that have vaccine clinic at the time will be listed so that you can sign up in one of those. Now, some of those folks will be using the system and you'll be able to schedule online then. Some of those folks will be using their own scheduling system. Either way, we will guide you and we will help you through, this, through the process in the system. If you end up signing up for something in the system, we have a lot of help for you. And we're really trying to do that because it's so important that people get the second dose. So once you sign up, you will get a confirmation email. Again, I'll talk about if you don't have technology, how we're helping with that, but you'll get a confirmation email. And then you will get a reminder email when your appointment's coming up. And then after you get your, um, your vaccine, your first dose, you know, you go in, um, then it will also give you an opportunity or it will send you another email saying congrats, you've got your first dose, and it will give you an opportunity to enter any adverse reactions. So there'll be links that come for three days after that asking for adverse reactions. And that's just to help us monitor and, and help make sure that we really are, are getting the facts about how this is working. We don't expect everybody to have adverse reactions, so don't be concerned about getting the vaccine. But, um, but you will get that opportunity. And at the time that you get done scheduling, you will also get an email asking you to schedule for your next appointment. Now, some of the local public health departments will help you with that while you're at your vaccine. Some of them will use this for the scheduling. Either way, we're here to hold your hand, okay, to help you make sure that you get that. Let's say life happens, you have a sick kid, you have to work late, you can't make your appointment. We want you to do everything you can to make that appointment. It's really important because we don't want doses to end up, you know, we scramble to fill those. But at the same time, we understand life happens. So there is an opportunity in the system to cancel and reschedule if you need to. So I just want you to know that we're kind of hand holding your hand all the way through just to help because this is so important. When you get to your second dose, that whole cycle repeats. You know, you get your reminders, you get your congratulations, you get your adverse reactions. So you get all of that. Um, we don't have yet, but we are working on a proof of confirmation so that I know that there's a lot of talk in the media about um, in some uh, companies talking about needing proof of vaccination for international travel or other things. Just know that we will have that, you know, very shortly for you so that you can have that as well. So that's kind of the flow of how it works. Now let me talk to you about a couple things if you're already registered. If you're already registered, I'll just repeat, don't register again, you're fine. It doesn't matter if you registered with the local public health department or with us, you'll be fine. And you don't need to call the local public health departments, let's let them spend their time scheduling the people that, that they have on their registries. Um, you will um, just be confident that it's in there. The, they will be sharing data with the state and we'll be sharing back and forth with them. So we will make sure that, you know, whichever place you register, we're getting that data to the right spot. Now there's one example of where you do need to re-register if you've already registered, so just this one. And that is if you're between the ages of 18 and 65 and you have a serious health condition. And Ryan, if you would show that page, please. Now there's a lot of words on here and I don't expect you to, to read them and memorize them very quickly. You can also find this list on the DHHS website. And on my last slide, I'm gonna show you where to find that. But in the meantime, if you kind of glance at this and you say, I have one of these, or you know, someone in my family has one of these, we do want you to re-register on the state website with those, and that's the only reason. Otherwise, you're registered. Okay, if you want to flip back for me, Ryan, thank you. Okay, 
So let's talk about how it works if you're selected. And I wanna use a little analogy because I think this helps people. Sometimes you just talk about this and it's confusing. So you think about um, if you are standing in line to go to a swimming pool. I'm gonna use that example because we use the word pool. So you're standing in line, there's some grandparents with their grandkids, there's some families, there's some teenagers wanna have fun, some little kids, they're all standing in line, they get into the pool. And over the course of the afternoon, more people come. When you're in the pool, you can't tell who came first to that swimming pool, right? You're just all there having fun. People are jumping off the diving board, they're having fun. And wouldn't that be nice right now? Because <laughs> it's pretty cold out. Um, but so there, you're in there, and that's what we call by putting things in the pool. And things, you know, it doesn't matter, it doesn't matter who got to that pool first, you're all having fun, right? So when we are in this pool for the vaccine and we're trying to pick who's next, what we're really looking at is that criteria that Angie's been talking about. So when you're in that pool, you can see who's elderly, you can see who's middle-aged, you can see the teenagers, you can see the kids. And so that's what we're looking at. So when you enter this data into this website, you are giving us this, the data that we need so that we can follow the CDC guidelines and we can follow what the local public health department people are doing to pick. And that's why I want you to understand it's really not first in, first out. As long as you go to the pool, as long as you register, you're in the pool and you will be picked appropriately. I hope that helps make that clearer. So the other thing I just wanted to note is we are trying to make sure that the vaccines, where they get allocated, because we're doing careful allocations with a lot of thought behind that, that the people who get notified are relatively close to that. So when we look at the pool to see who's next following those guidelines, we will be picking people from those local public health departments to match the number of allocations they have. That helps them kind of stay in sync so you're not traveling across the state. If you hear about that, because there are other states who have launched this system and they are asking their people to travel across the state, we are not doing that. So just know that it's as close as your local public health department. All right? So again, just reiterating, it's not first registered, first get in the next vaccine. Ryan, if you wanna to move to one more slide then. Okay, so I have um, just one more slide to talk about access for everyone. So if technology or language or access is a problem, the first thing that we would suggest is ask a friend or relative to register for you. And if you don't have an email address and you trust them or the phone number, you could give it to them and have them tell you when these things come. If that doesn't work for you, and that's fine, it doesn't for everybody, we do have a Nebraska vaccination hotline, and you can see the numbers right here. They have the ability to take relay calls for um, the deaf and hard of hearing. Um, they have a language line access with 108 languages, and they also have um, Spanish-speaking folks who are, on, um, who are on every shift. So they should be able to help you. The third option, which we would prefer that you go to the vaccination hotline first, because there's a lot of help, is to call your local public health department or to reach out to your state associations. And one thing that you'll see in the website, when you go to enter a phone number or an email address, those are required. But if you don't have one and you put, we've got in the, the vaccination hotlines numbers above and their email above those addresses, if you put those in the fields, if you don't have one, then we have a process that the Nebraska hotline will get that information. They will forward it to your local public health department and those local public health department people will help you make sure that you get notified of all the steps. So we've tried to make sure that we're not, you know, that we've got good processes so that people aren't disadvantaged if they don't have technology. Um, we're expecting the Spanish registration portal. This says 2-5, but it should say about 2-15. So just note that we're talking about mid-February. Um, and then we will be translating the materials um, on the website into multiple languages, the training materials I'm talking about here. We do have the call-in number um, instructions in four languages right now, so you can see that, um, so that you can get help with the vaccine hotline if you need that. Um, and also, we have been working with the Nebraska Nebraska Commission for the Blind and Visually Impaired, the Commission for the Deaf and Hard of Hearing and Disability Rights Nebraska to try to make sure that we have access for you. So what you've all been waiting for. Here is the registration site. Um, if you go to www.vaccinate.ne.gov, um, uh, you, I think in, in most browsers, you don't have to type in the dub 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 because I think it's actually, you might need to um, just leave that part off, but 
Um, you can go there and register. Again, we really do want you to register. We need people to register to make this really effectively get the whole population, but you don't have to rush. And then there are questions, um, frequently asked questions and training materials on the website, and you can see the address here, and we will publish that. So closing, I know this is a lot of information. I hope this was helpful, but continue to practice the three Cs because that's what's going to keep us all safe. So thank you for your time. I appreciate it. Thank you, Lori. Great job. Obviously, a lot of information there with regards to the website. We'll go back to questions and answers here in just a moment, but uh, appreciate all the work there with regard to that. Uh, a couple of things. Again, one of the things Angie talked about was increase in vaccinations. We'd received an increased allocation of Moderna for next week. Uh, when I was on a call with the White House earlier this week, they said it was going to be 16%. Obviously, we're falling just a, a little bit short of 15, 16%, but what they uh, hopefully we'll be able to deliver that 16% through the course of February that will allow us to be able to uh, up the number of vaccinations that we're doing. So good news from that front. We just need to make sure we continue to get uh, that increase in allocation. And uh, again, thank you, Lori, with regard to the website here. Again, just to reiterate that if you signed up with your local public health department, you don't have to sign up on this one. Uh, we were working with those local public health departments. Unless you've got that underlying health condition, then go back onto the state's website so we can make sure we can capture that data and know that you've got one of those underlying health care conditions uh, that may help prioritize you in the order of getting a vaccine. And as Lori mentioned, this is not going to be a first come, first serve. Uh, we're going to work with the groups that are priorities, again, 75 year old, 65 year old, uh, underlying health care conditions. Those are the folks, so it doesn't matter when you sign up necessarily. Uh, we want you to do it, you know soon, but you don't have to worry that you're, gonna get, you're not going to get in front of somebody if you sign up to them faster if they're a higher priority. They will go before you uh, if they're a higher priority, even if they sign up later. So again, just be aware of that out there. Um, gosh, I think, that, I think that covers it for that. All right, great. Uh, let's see. We got, uh, I, I will be this afternoon at 1.30 in front of the Revenue Committee again. I was testifying earlier this week with regard to LR22CA. Uh, Wednesday, which is why we didn't have our Wednesday press briefing. This afternoon, I'll be back in front of the Revenue Committee talking about LB 387. That's our Veterans Relief Tax Package. Uh, last year, we got the 50 percent for our veterans to be able to make sure their military retirement benefits were not being taxed. We got 50 percent. We're asking for the other 50 percent from this legislative session, and that will make us competitive with five of the six surrounding states who don't tax those military retirement benefits at all. So I'll be doing that at 1.30. And then we will have news conference on the Governor's Wellness Walk at 10 a.m. on Monday, Central Time. So Wellness Walk, 10 a.m. Monday. All right. So let's go ahead and get into, oh, I know, I was one of the things I was going to say uh, with regard to reiterating what Lori said. So if you're, if you're not one of those folks who has an email address or access to the website or comfortable using technology, first choice is see if you can get a, a family member to be able to help you with that. Uh, they can use the same email, ad email address they're using. They'll get a separate email for you. If you trust them, you can share that information. That's the first choice we'd ask you to do. Second dose is the hot, or the second choice is that hotline that Lori was talking about. The, the third choice is calling your local health department or working with one of your associations. But please start with those first two choices um, before you start calling our local health departments because they're already very busy trying to help people get the vaccine. All right, questions. Uh, Paul Hamill, Omaha World Herald. Uh, the Friends of the Environmental Trust are criticizing the governor um, uh, for the all-white male makeup of the trust board after recent appointments that shows a lack of diversity and is backward. Uh, well, a couple things. One, um, the Friends of the Environmental Trust are a politically motivated lobbyist group, so let's keep that in mind in the first place. Uh, Second place, in my administration, you know, you look at my cabinet, we've got an African-American woman running our biggest department, Health and Human Services, uh, an African-American man running the Department of Economic Development, one of our most important cabinets to, to grow the state, uh, a woman in charge of the DMV, you just saw here, Lori Snyder, our Chief Information Officer, uh, Angie Ling, our Incident Commander, again, working for Danette in our Department of Health and Human Services. So we look for talent is what we look for. And that's, that's what we do. We don't, and in the state of Nebraska, we don't have quotas. 
we look to hire the best people. And you know, just again, if you look at the track record the state has, we've increased minority hiring by 40 or 50 percent during my administration. So we look for the best talent. Second question was, um, this group also uh, is critical of the reappointment of Rod Christensen and Jim Helbush due to the role of their overturning grant recommendations last year uh, to divert a million dollars in trust fund grants to an ethanol uh, uh, project and away from other projects. So a couple things. One, first of all, the board is well within their statutory authority and their rights to determine what projects get funded. That's what a board is supposed to do. And ethanol helps clean up the air. It has fewer carbon emissions, other things that are toxic that you find in gasoline. That cleans up the environment. So it was perfectly appropriate for them to prioritize something that's going to help clean up our air here in Nebraska and help us make sure we continue to have clean air. And uh, just uh, getting back to, uh, again, uh, talking about the makeup of the board, uh, one of the outgoing board members who was a woman recommended one of the incoming board members. And I might point out that this group, uh, again, also misspelled the name of people. So like, they're kind of a schlocky op operation. You can't even get the name. You're misspelling names when you're putting out your press release. So let's just keep that all in mind. Uh, second question, Grant Schulte uh, from the Associated Press. If Angie Schling is there today, which she is, I'd like to know how the new website is functioning as planned any hiccups and any, actually this is really more a question for Lori. So we're gonna have Lori come up and just uh, talk about just how the you know, first day went with regard to being able to handle the capacity and all that sort of stuff. All right, thanks for that. Well, I think we did pretty well. So we um, were taking about 2,000 um, registrations every 10 minutes or so into the afternoon and we didn't have any hiccups with the website. Um, we did have a few calls about um, on the review screen where there was one field that didn't map correctly on that field, but super simple thing and the data underneath was fine. So we double checked that. So we um, really had it pretty, pretty simple. So I'm, I'm expecting more volume today. We have this um, in a very secure environment. So I'm expecting that security will be fine. And uh, we took about 700 calls on the call line and, and answered all but I've had 30 of those. So. So far, so good, and um, I want you guys to all root for it, and uh, hopefully it'll continue that way. Thank you, Lori. All right, and uh, let's see. Okay, great. Matt Oberding, Lincoln Journal Star. Do you guys have any early stats on how many people signed up to the new state vaccine website? We covered that, 54,000. With the additional Moderna vaccine the state is getting next week, will be divvied up using the current formula. Uh, for example, will Lancaster County roughly still get about 16.5% of the allocation? Yeah, absolutely. So with the increased uh, doses of vaccine coming in, we will still allocate that based upon the population we are currently serving and per health district. So it is a per capita of the population we're serving. So for example, right now, Douglas County is getting about 6,650 6, uh, allocations under the current. It'll go up by whatever the the proportional population is for that. It's about 29% right now, so it'll stay roughly around that 29%. Uh, does the governor have any thoughts about companies encouraging people to get vaccinated by offering cash bonuses? You know, uh, certainly we want people to get signed up. We want people to get vaccinated. Uh, you know, these vaccines are 95% effective, and this is what how we're going to work our way through the pandemic. So if companies want to encourage their people by paying cash bonuses, that is certainly up to the companies to make that decision but we're encouraging people just to get signed up and get vaccinated. It's gonna be um, the way we work our way through this pandemic, so it's gonna be important. All right, so those are the questions I had written down. Taylor, did you have other questions that were submitted? Marlo from Channel 8 is asking about the Johnson & Johnson vaccine. Do we know when we might receive that? Uh, Johnson Johnson actually just received, released some information about the efficacy of their vaccine today. The last I had heard was that they were planning on submitting their request to the FDA for an emergency use authorization at the end of February, early March. I don't know where that time that where that timetable is. It maybe it moved up. I don't know, which would mean that if we could potentially get that emergency use authorization in the first, you know, ten to 15 days of March. And at that time, we would then see an allocation, additional allocation coming to the state of Nebraska. But 
With regard to any specific numbers, I just don't have those. So uh, Matt Oberding is asking, with uh, the increase in vaccines being allocated starting next week, almost 16 percent more, will that, alloc will that change our allocation program? And no, it will not change it. We will continue to focus on phase 1B starting with 65-year-olds and older. We will work our way through that population. That's where we're asking 90 percent of the effort to be you know, focused on in our local health department. So hopefully that will help us get through that phase faster, but we're not going to be changing the plan itself, we're still going to be focusing on those folks who are most at risk. And if I could just cover that again real quick, when you look at Nebraska's data from last year, 2020, our deaths, and Angie, I'm asking, going to ask you to jump in here if, if I get anything wrong or Dr. Antone, but the deaths per 100,000 in the age category of 45 to 64 was 56, and if you were 65 years and older, that was 509, almost 10 times more. That's why we're focusing on those 65 years and older. And so that's why, even with more vaccines, we're going to continue to focus on folks who are 65 years and older. Patrick from East Hamilton, Nebraska says, why are Grand Pass Church and Douglas County behind the rest of the state when it comes to leading the phase one B? So I'm sorry, who was that asking the question? Patrick from East Hamilton, Nebraska. Patrick from News Channel, Nebraska was asking, why are Lincoln and uh, Lincoln Lancaster and Douglas County behind the rest of the state as far as getting into phase one B? I think there's a variety of reasons, one of which uh, they may have more health care workers, right? So you've got three major health care systems in Omaha. You've got Brian here in, in Lincoln. So with more health care workers, there, and in fact, I think a lot of even people who live in Sarpy County w may work in Douglas County. So they're, they're working through their health care workers to be able to get through that. And so uh, also, same thing may be true for long-term care facilities. I don't know, do they, they've got more long-term care facilities as well. So again, if you've got more in that phase 1A, you just got to work your way through it, and that's the case for Douglas and uh, Lincoln Lancaster. Uh, Ian Cooley with KDTV says uh, she has a question for Lori. Lori, can you please come on up? And, and Lori, remember, please repeat the question. That's right. Thank you. So Amsley um, asked the question of if you're, when it gets to the general population, is it first come, first serve? It is not. It will be randomized. We're not publishing the way that we're randomizing it because we don't want people to try to um, guess about that, but it will be random. We are not going to have first come, first serve. Thank you, Lori. So again, just emphasizing that you don't have to all rush to get signed up right away. We want you to do it in good time, but it's going to be a random selection when we get to the general population. Sarah with KDTV says, uh, if you live in one county more than another, is it possible to get vaccine in the county they work in? Is that why the state has to ask for occupational testing? So the question was, Sarah KETV wants to know if I get uh, vaccinated or if I live in one county but work in another, uh, will it be possible to get vaccinated in the county I work in? And so I'm looking over here, Angie, to you, or Lori, do you want to come up and talk about that a little bit? So he, the governor already repeated the question, right? So I'm good with that. Yeah. Um, so we are really encouraging people to get vaccinated in the county that they live in rather than the county that they work in. And the reason why we ask the work in county is because we do have some people who are from out of state who work and we just wanna gather that information. We're vaccinating Nebraskans first, but we wanna gather that information so that as we get deeper in, if we need to vaccinate them at the end, we can. So it's, that's more of a data point to gather, but we're vaccinating Nebraskans first. But just to reiterate again, we're looking for you to get vaccinated in the county that you live in, not the county you work in. So Julie at uh, the World Herald wants to know that if 10% is being allowed to go to uh, workplaces, what will those workplaces be? That's published on our website, so just go to the vaccine work page. You'll see the different tiers there. It starts with law enforcement and works its way down. I don't happen to have that right in front of me. But I would also uh, reiterate, that's at the discretion of the local health director. 
So the local health director may decide all 100% is gonna go to 65 years and older. We're giving them some flexibility if the local health directors feel the need for specific uh, groups in those populations, but it's not required. Uh, the 90% is really a guideline to really emphasize on the 65 year or older, but it's gonna be up to the local health director. So I'd just say go to the website, look at our, uh, you know, the vaccine website, and you'll be able to see that, you know, get that list of what those tiers look like. Uh, dhhs.ne.gov, dhhs and click on the vaccine plan, or there's a link to the vaccine. You'll be able to find a link to the vaccine plan there. So uh, Martha from the World Herald is asking, when we're doing the allocation based on populations, taking into account that you may have, say, some counties or some health districts that have more, uh, say, people who are 65 years and older and that sort of thing, and is the vaccine allocation being adjusted for that? And the answer is yes. Okay. The folks here in the studio audience, Andrew. So Andrew's question is, um, the federal government required us to over allocate vaccine to the federal pharmacy program. We are working to get that over allocation back and do we know how many that is? Angie, I think from CVS, do you wanna come up here and just address that, Angie? Yeah, so Angie's just gonna come up here and address that. We don't have all the final numbers, but we do know CVS over allocated, they're comfortable returning 5,850 doses back to the state. Now the difference in that is those are first and second doses, so you'll wanna split that in half for first doses of additional people we could vaccinate. Um, and we expect Walgreens um, to have their numbers and community pharmacy to have those numbers no later than Monday or Tuesday. So we'll be able to give um, more information regarding those numbers next week. Sure, so the question is, um, how will those get allocated? Um, will they stay in major counties or will they go across the state in the same uh, method that we're distributing? So the, the difference with those um, doses is that they're all Pfizer, so we do have to take into consideration the ultra-cold storage. So we will allocate based on ultra-cold storage and then um, it'll be population. Sure, so the question is, um, let me make sure I restate this correctly, is it, will the distribution be age-based or will it be adjusted for like 90 plus, 80 plus? Is that, am I saying that correctly? Okay, um, so many of the health, so our initial algorithm on will prioritize the 75 and older and then the 65 and older. Um, and so we are taking into consideration those older populations. And then many of the health departments, as you saw, Douglas County did 80 and older is their priority. So we are trying to target those that are most vulnerable. Anything else? Okay. Yeah, and if I could just piggyback on Angie's question there. Um, so for example, Central Health District started with 80 years and older. So I think you're seeing, and again, it's up to the discretion of the local health director, them really starting with the older population, even though we said 75 years and older, uh, Teresa started with 80 years and older to, to make sure we were prioritizing those older folks. And then just one other thing for uh, Julie had asked about, you know, why, or somebody asked about why uh, Lincoln Lancaster might be behind. And also part of what we saw is it depends on the uptake rate as well. Uh, if you have districts where in the phase 1A population group, if you had more people who were declining to get the vaccine, then obviously you could move on to other groups faster. So that would be another reason why you saw some of the differences between the different local health, uh, the different local health departments. Yeah, Andrew. Um, so Andrew's asking about the St. Francis contract. Uh, we're negotiating a revised contract and have we signed that? I've received no updates, and to my knowledge, we have not signed that contract, but I know that we're in the process of it right now. And do you, do you foresee the full four years? You know, do you, do you go 
So the question is, are we going to re-up for the four-year contract? And that would be the intention. And um, just how can you do that as far as the kind of incentive you have to put them in the bid if, you, if it's more than – it's not an emergency, I guess. I guess can you, how can you do so with an emergency bid if it's a four-year contract? Yeah, so uh, the question was, how do you declare an emergency to a four-year contract? And prob now we're getting now you're getting into the details, Andrew. I'm probably going to have to refer you to uh, somebody in the Department of Health and Human Services who's more familiar with these contract negotiations. But uh, Taylor will follow up with you with regard to getting you that information. And, and did you get the statement that the um, you know uh, the same, how did you get the statement that the same transit uh, um, uh, COO made to Kansas Red State about that? Uh, so the question was, uh, how did I take the statement from um, the St. Francis folks uh, that if they don't get the money, they're walking? You know, again, we're trying to negotiate in a spirit of good faith here to be able to make sure we're taking care of the families here in Nebraska. So we're hopeful that we can come to that agreement and uh, have St. Francis continue to take care of those families in the Eastern Service Area. All right, any other questions? All right, I'm not seeing any. Uh, again, folks, please remember, even though we're moving into a new phase of our directed health measures, that we need people to continue to use all the tools to slow the spread of the virus, especially with some of these new variations that may be out there. That means please continue to keep that six foot of distance between you and other people. Wear a mask when you go to the store. Wash your hands often for 20 seconds at a time. That actually kills the virus. If you got that cough, if you got that fever, please stay home. Uh, it's very important. Obviously, all the quarantine rules are still in place. If you test positive, you need to isolate. Do not go out in public and infect other people. You cannot do that. Um, we do have some new rules on DHM. If you've had COVID before, uh, you can wear a mask and self-monitor. You don't have to quarantine. If you get vaccinated, the full vaccination, twice, right? Same deal. But we need people to please continue to follow these rules while we're making progress with regard to getting people vaccinated and our hospitalization numbers were down, as you saw earlier. Brian, go ahead, Brian, bring that back up. Mm, 341 anyway. Uh, while we're making progress on all those things, we need people to continue to stay vigilant and continue to wear your mask in public and all that sort of thing so that we can slow, slow the spread of virus here so that we can make sure that we preserve our hospital capacity, get people vaccinated as these new strains start spreading across our country and the world, the best defense we got is get people vaccinated. So let's slow it down so we can get people vaccinated and preserve our hospital capacity. Thank you all very much again. And we'll see you all back here at 10 a.m. for the governor's wellness walk. We'll start it, we'll do it. We'll start the press conference here in the, uh, the hearing room, and then we will go outside to do our walk. Thanks very much, and everybody have a great weekend. Thank you, Francis.